Okay, very nice. As you know, uh, for the last couple of years, I've been doing these Wondrous Life series. And uh, we started with the Wondrous Life of Abraham, and then we did the Wondrous Life of Joseph, the Old Testament Joseph. Uh, then we did the Wondrous Life of Moses, and then we did the Wondrous Life of David, and then we did the Wondrous Life of Daniel. And uh, now we're hopping into the New Testament, and we're doing the Wondrous Life of Peter, St. Peter. And so tonight's lesson is Lesson 1, and it's the man God chose, uh, because when it all comes down to God chose this guy <laughs> for a very important role, I mean, extremely important role. And so we want to look to see, you know, who is this guy and what was his nature? What was his character like that God would be interested in bringing him in and using him for such an enormous task? So we're going to spend the next few months with St. Peter. And that sounds good, right? Uh, there's worse people we can hang out with. And so we're going to be with St. Peter. We're going to study the life of the man that the Holy Trinity chose. The Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit chose this guy to be the chief apostle of the New Covenant. Um, out of all the people in the world, he's chosen for that. We're going to study the life of the man divinely selected to be the foundational leader of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We're going to study the life of the man chosen by God to become the first bishop of Rome and set the stage for the rest of them. And by the way, on that whole thing, you know, Bishop of Rome, there's a lot to being the Bishop of Rome, obviously. But I, I think there's a core idea that we should never forget. And with this guy, Peter, as we look at him and study him, and that's a great painting. Um, I hadn't really seen that one before. And of course, that would have been Peter. We, we don't know what Peter looked like. Um, but you have an idea in your head, right? And as an older man, maybe right before uh, his death in Rome, uh, this is just a look on his face, and it's just a lot of character there. So I like that painting. Uh, so we'll use that quite a bit. The Bishop of Rome. Um, like I said, there's more to it, but I don't want us to forget this. It's a position divinely ordained for the protection, defense, and promotion of the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Uh, in Jude chapter 3, uh, we read, Beloved, contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And kind of what do we mean by that? Well, the faith, the new covenant, um, the whole content of this thing was given by Christ to Peter and the apostles. Peter and the apostles. And they promoted it in the world. These guys promoted it big time in the world. They lived it. They preached it. They taught it. And they wrote it down. And they called all men to it. Uh, the apostles didn't look at the faith as like an option. You can have this or you can go do another religion or whatever. Uh, the apostles were calling all men to Christ and to the Christian faith, to the Catholic Christian faith. And in the first century, and, and they said there was, they were so specific, they said there was no other way to heaven except through Christ. And so therefore we must believe that, we must uh, evangelize. These things are all very important. We, we've got to see conversions because we care about people enough to see them come to salvation in Christ and spend eternity reconciled with God in his presence. So we do convert, we do uh, evangelize, all that stuff is super important. And in the first century, because of the work of the apostles and the people that worked with the apostles, many people came to faith in Christ and were reconciled to God and the church was thriving. And that's just, when you study the first century, Book of Acts, and then after that, when you read the Church Fathers, uh, the church was just wonderful. It was very crystal clear as to what they were saying, what they believed, what they were calling people to. Uh, they were going wild, like I said, with evangelization, and they wanted everybody to come to faith in Christ. It, it was really spectacular. Um, those who entered the church were taught the Word of God, received the sacraments, and their lives were completely changed. So this, when you look at the first century church in the book of Acts, and like I said, even after that, you see this really dynamic setting, this amazing spirit. Um, it, it's so encouraging to read it. They went, they converted people, and when people were converted, they taught them the word of God, all of it, and they received the sacraments. And like I said, the people's lives were changed. If you have the word of God, you're studying and knowing scripture, and you're receiving the sacraments, this forms Christ in you. I mean, it changes you radically. 
And this is the very thing, this thing that they did in the first century with evangelization, starting with the apostles and the first century church and the faithful church throughout the centuries. This is what they did. And like I said, because of the study of the word of God, the people that had converted and come to faith in Christ, their lives were very much changed. You need both word and sacrament. God has given both. Um, it, it cars out of alignment. If, you know, it, it, when it's out of alignment, it'll veer to one side or to the other side, right, of the road. Um, and when it's in alignment, you can let go of the steering wheel for a little while and things just going straight down the middle, right, like it's supposed to. And we need, Christians need the Eucharist and the Word of God. I, I've been around, right, Catholic for the first 18 years of my life, then Protestant for a very long time, and now back in the, the Catholic Church. And one of the things that I see and experience myself is that if you just have the Eucharist and you don't have the Word of God, you are out of alignment. Because I grew up like that. And then I veered off the road a bit. Um, and then when I was a Protestant, I had the Word of God and I didn't have the Eucharist. So I was veering <laughs> to the other side of the road. And now back in uh, having the Scripture and having the sacraments, having the Eucharist, um, I'm in alignment. I don't, sometimes I'm tempted to, you know, but I'm in alignment and I feel it. And I've really experienced since being back in the Catholic Church, uh, a level of spiritual growth and intimacy, a very real feeling of these things uh, with Christ, with God. God's more, he's always been real uh, to me, but there's almost like if he walked in the door, if Jesus walked in the door, I'd be shocked, but not too shocked because I already feel like he's here, you know, and I think you all feel the same way. And so the Eucharist is a huge part of that, the Word of God. This is Christ coming to us in these things, and they're both very important. The faith given by Christ is to be received by every generation of the church and boldly proclaimed in the world and then passed on to the next generation as it was received. And it's not to be tinkered with because it cannot be improved on. The apostle, Jesus gave it to the apostles, the apostles you know, promoted it in the world. They founded the church. In Ephesians chapter 2, the, the apostles are the foundation of the church. Christ is the cornerstone. And so we take what Jesus gave the apostles, the apostles gave to us. Every generation embraces it, lives according to it, promotes it, protects it, and passes it on to the next generation. Like I said, not tinkering with it. It's very, very dangerous to do that because uh, it's awesome. And all men are to be called to it in every generation. And to, we're to do this until Jesus comes back. The Lord has ordered this, that the church is embracing what we receive from the apostles, and we are calling all men to come to faith in Christ. Where nobody's to, when, when people look at the Catholic Church, they should say, all those people believe the only way to heaven is through Christ. And they believe it with all their heart. Um, and they go about telling people this. And they're working to bring people to Christ. That's super, super important. All men are to be called to it. The whole earth must know that there's no other way to God except through Jesus. He said that himself. Belief in Christ, love of Christ, loyalty to his word, all of that. I mean, you look at Acts chapter 4, 10 through 12. Uh, this is Peter preaching to the religious rulers of Jerusalem. This is after Jesus ascended, after the day of Pentecost. The church is just getting started. And Peter is obviously, as we're going to see as we go through the study in the book of Acts, he is the lead apostle. You see it in the Gospels and you see it in the book of Acts. Uh, and he says to them, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, there is, it should be an is there, there is salvation in no other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so you see this passion and people were being converted. Uh, the Holy Spirit was drawing people into the church as the message, this message was getting out. So like I said, the church is to call all men to Christ. The Lord ordered this. And when people come, the church today is to teach them the word of God, all of it. That's just so important. And provide people with the sacraments so that their lives will be transformed. Um, look at this is the Apostle Paul. I've got a picture of Peter there just kind of overseeing the church. But Romans 8 was written by the Apostle Paul. And he says that for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He's talking about everybody who's brought to faith in Christ, everybody who's brought into the church. The purpose for that is for people to be conformed into the image of Christ. So we learn scripture and we align our lives to it. And we receive the sacraments and the graces of the church. And as this is happening, the nature of Christ is formed in us. 
and we're being conformed into the image of God's Son. In the leadership of the church, all the successors of Peter have the divine responsibility to make sure all of this stuff is happening. If this isn't getting done, it doesn't matter what else is getting done. This is the core. This is what the Lord ordered. Uh, and this is what the church is to do until Jesus comes back. And those who do this are going to be seen as faithful in, in the sight of God. And like I said, when you study the Gospels and the book of Acts, the whole New Testament, this is crystal clear. I don't know how it can ever be missed, uh, but it's very, very important to our Lord. All right, then we have, this is St. Paul writing to Timothy, to St. Timothy, who was a bishop. And look what he says to Timothy. He says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Now, the way he sets that up, I mean, look what he says. He says, Timothy, I'm charging you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. So preach the word. I mean, that's, he just kind of says, I'm about to say something extremely important. Preach the word. Uh, like I said, you see this all throughout scripture. So if there was ever anything needed today in our world, it is a church that reflects the patterns and priorities of the church of the apostles in the first century. Desperately. A church that boldly and faithfully proclaims the word of God in the world. Because our world has become chaotic. At every level, it's chaotic. It's chaotic in its thinking. It's chaotic in its actions. And it's getting, it's very serious. And the more we hear about what's going on in the world, the less we think we can do anything about it. Because it just seems like such a big problem. But the key, and this is what I think all the time, there has to be divine intervention. There has to be divine intervention. This problem is so huge. Uh, God has to come riding into the rescue if he so chooses. And so since there must be divine intervention, what can we do? Well, we pray, 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 pray for divine intervention. This is what I do. I tell you what, uh, in the mass, when it is said, as we're heading into communion, deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil and grant us peace in our day. I pray that like I've never prayed it. I've always heard it, but when, when the priest is saying that, I am, I am in my heart saying that with them, and I'm praying it to God. A, a deep, deep prayer. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. And so we can do that. Please deliver us. Come to our rescue. You know, grant us peace in our day. He doesn't have to do that, but we're asking in his grace and mercy, please, we'd love to have peace in our land, peace in our day, peace in our lives. And so we do that, we pray, and we do everything we can to see people, both children and adults, hear the word of God. I cannot stress how important this is. For the word of God brings order out of the chaos. It's the word of God that brings order out of chaos. I think it's interesting in the book of Genesis, when things are just getting started, the first two chapters, we're told that God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. And there it is in this formless and void state. And then we're told that God begins speaking, let there be light, let there be, let there be, let there be. And when he got done speaking, his word going forth to that which was formless and void, it became something incredibly beautiful full of life and full of beauty and color. Uh, it was chaotic and it was formless. And then God spoke and he brought beauty out of the chaos and the formlessness. And this is what he does. This is what his word does. Uh, the scripture says that the word of God will not return to him void. When he speaks, it does things. It's active. It creates. It causes change. It's very, very powerful. So this is why it's important we preach the word of God. This world is chaotic, and the only thing that can bring order is the word of God going forth boldly everywhere, from like every parish across the world. If every parish across the world started boldly preaching the word of God, seriously taking it serious, believing it, and preaching it, this would have an effect on the world. It, no doubt it would. And it, it's happening in some places, but not enough, by far not enough. Every last bit of strength and energy that the church has must be given to teaching and preaching the word of God. And I ask that you please pray for this. Seriously, put it on your prayer list. When you're in adoration, when you're in mass, pray that the church would just get fired up about teaching, preaching, proclaiming the word of God in the world. Uh, and then watch what God does with that. 
All right, so the founding, when we think about it, the founding and early history of the United States was steeped in and deeply affected by the word of God. It was. Churches preached the word of God. The Bible was a big deal in people's homes, in the churches, everywhere. The word of God, the scripture, the Bible was looked at as the very words of the creator. And people bowed to its authority. And preachers boldly proclaimed it in the world. I mean, we see that when you study early American history, this was going on and going on in a big way. Through this, towns and villages, cities and states, and the entire nation was constantly reminded that God was there. Not everybody became a believer, but everybody was always reminded that God is there, you're responsible to him. He sees everything. And that had an effect that deeply affected our country. And in this land, there was a healthy fear of God and a respect for the things of God. And this influenced all of society. It influenced our justice system. It influenced our politics. It influenced our work ethic. It influenced our family life. It influenced our business practices. It influenced everything. And it filled this country with goodness and decency and law and order. It had a huge effect. You can time the turning off of the teaching of the word of God in this country to everything basically going toward hell <laughs> in a big way. This is why, because of the influence that the word of God has, this is why the evil one has worked so hard to remove the presence of scripture from the church and society and culture. He's worked very hard at that, and he's done a very good job. He's been very effective at attaining his goals. You know, remove scripture and then watch everything just kind of fall apart because it's the word of God that brings order, keeps order. Uh, and when you take that away from creation, things fall apart. And so this is so this is so important. And this is why I started the DeSales Forum, you know, to play a small part. I realize it's such a small part. Uh, I just figured you got to do what you can do, right? And so this is a small part in getting the content of scripture out to people. This is why we do the scripture study here at the Holy Spirit. And this is why I teach at JP2, because I teach scripture from beginning of August to the end of May every year. And it's just boom, boom, boom. You know, and we go through the scripture and I watch as it has an effect, you know, planting seeds. Some of them, I can see the seeds sprout up while they're there and some will come later. Uh, but you got to give people the scripture. And so there's nothing more powerful, nothing more helpful. And like I said, I didn't get to know the Bible until I started to get to know the Bible when I was 18. And uh, boy, as soon as I was exposed to it, and I've told you this before, it radically changed my life. Radically changed my life. And I love the, I love the Word of God. And um, because, not just because, it, it's true, that's why I love it. Uh, but that true Word of God really did a number on me and changed my life and gave me hope, and gave me new life. Uh, this, is, this is why it's so important. Scripture proclaimed results in the salvation of souls and the restoration of divine order in lives and in culture. And as we're doing this study here on St. Peter, each week we're going to look at from Scripture, we're going to get into the Scripture, from the Gospels and from the Book of Acts and from First and Second Peter, we're going to look at some of the major events that involved this man that we know as St. Peter. And we're going to get to know the real Peter better. And I would ask that any ideas that you have of Peter from media, just kind of put them on the shelf. I'm not saying you have to put them in the trash. I'm not saying that. You just put them on the shelf. And as we go through scripture, see if those portrayals of Peter match what you see in the Bible. Because um, it's not always so, but, you know, you just kind of don't have that person, that kind of character, maybe that you've seen somewhere uh, on your mind as we're going through it. Put it on the shelf and say, well, I don't know if that's true. We'll find out in Scripture. See, see if it matches the Bible's teaching and presentation of St. Peter. All right, so we're going to get to know him better, and we're going to note the kind of man that he was, and we're going to thus, when we know what kind of man he was and know what he was chosen for, we're going to see the kind of man God's pleased with the kind of man God desires to lead his church and will better understand God's intention for our lives too and his intention for his church, all of that. All right, so we'll hop into St. Peter. Now, I, I think you know that his given name was Simon. In, he, in Hebrew, the word Simon has the idea of listening, the meaning of it, listening or hearing, but the kind of listening and hearing that you obey, that you give yourself to. 
it's not just passive, it's something you're hearing so that you can do. And that's what that name brings with it, which is interesting when you see St. Peter. His given name is Simon. Uh, in the late centuries BC, uh, this name Simon was one of the most popular names, male names, for Jews in Judea. So there was a lot of Simons running around, a lot of them. In the New Testament, the name Simon occurs over 70 times, and it covers a number of different Simons that are brought up. And Jesus had two disciples with this name. Simon, the son of John, sometimes uh, in the scripture, it's son of Jonah. We'll talk about that in a second. And as you know, this is the Simon who will eventually, by Jesus, be, be given the name Peter, meaning rock. And we'll actually look at that next week. And then there's the lesser known disciple, Simon the Zealot, also called Simon the Canaanian or Canaanite sometimes in, in scripture. And most, a lot of scholars believe that he's called that because he came from the town of Cana in the land of Galilee, which is where Jesus worked uh, his first public miracle with the changing of water into wine. Uh, he's often referred to as St. Simon the Apostle, which is interesting because that's the, in St. Louis where I grew up. That's the parish church, St. Simon the Apostle, I grew up in. Uh, but he's not, there's not too much known about uh, Simon the Zealot or St. Simon the Apostle. But there were two Simons within the 12 that Jesus chose. It kind of shows you how common the name was. The Simon that we're focusing on, the one who will become Peter, is referred to in Scripture as both Simon the son of John, you see that sometimes, and Simon the son of Jonah. And you say, what's going on there? Well, it's hard to know, and there's a lot of different views, but some people say that the names John and Jonah at, in that day were basically the same name, and they're just kind of used interchangeably. Some say that Simon's father's name was John, but Jesus also refers to Simon as son of Jonah because Simon was a descendant of a man named Jonah and maybe even the prophet Jonah. And a man can be referred to as the son of one of his ancestors. I, I am the son of Adam and I'm the son of Noah <laughs> because I descended from those dudes. And I, there's a lot more people that I descended from too, all right, that are my ancestors. And so some believe that there was a Jonah, or maybe even the Jonah, the prophet, and Peter was a descendant of that Jonah, that man, maybe even the prophet. Some believe that Jesus refers to Simon as the son of Jonah because he wants us to compare and contrast Simon Peter to the prophet Jonah. And we're going to see when we get into the scripture, the scripture does that quite a bit. It's pretty powerful stuff, too, where it does con contrast Peter to the prophet Jonah. Uh, Peter is a better Jonah. All these views seem to have some truth to them. They're interesting to think about, but you will see Simon, son of John. You'll see Simon, son of Jonah uh, sometimes. Now, we know little about Simon's childhood, but it looks like he was raised and he spent a lot of time in the town of Bethsaida. And uh, where's Bethsaida? Well, there's Jerusalem, and then north of that, you see the Sea of Galilee. So we're going to zoom in to the Sea of Galilee there, and uh, we see Bethsaida. And John 1.44 says Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So we find out there that they originated there, Andrew and Peter, brothers, and that's the town that they were originally from. We know that he, Simon, had at least one sibling, a brother, Andrew, and both of these guys, Simon and Andrew, were chosen by Jesus to be part of the Twelve. It's interesting, these brothers are chosen. At some point, Simon and Andrew moved from Bethsaida to Capernaum. So you see Bethsaida there to the east of Capernaum. So they moved. It wasn't that far, but they moved to the city of Capernaum. And that they both worked as fishermen upon the Sea of Galilee, which is right on the Sea of Galilee, the town of Capernaum. Let me, see, do I, let me read these passages before I move on. Mark 1, 29. Now, this, in the context, this is in Capernaum. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew. And then Luke 4.38, and this is in Capernaum too. Now he, Jesus, arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Uh, so we know that Simon Peter now lived in Capernaum, and he had a house there in that city. Now, in Capernaum, Simon and Andrew become partners with some other fishermen. Uh, two brothers named James and John, and their father was Zebedee, and he was part of the deal. 
So Simon and Andrew are partners with James and John and their dad, Zebedee, in the fishing business there on the Sea of Galilee. And these two sons of Zebedee, James and John, will also, both of them, will be called by Jesus to be part of the Twelve. So the brothers Simon and Andrew were friends and work associates with the brothers James and John and their dad, their father Zebedee, before Jesus came and called Simon, Andrew, James, and John to be part of his twelve. They all knew each other. They all had worked every day together. They knew each other well, even before they became disciples of Christ. And look at this. This is where we get this in Luke chapter 5. And this is interesting. I just got this note. You notice Simon is immediately seen as central. Every time things are brought up about the disciples, Simon is central and kind of pulled out as unique. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And so this is this event, all of them see this a miracle take place. They hadn't caught anything all night. And Jesus says, you know, do it this way. And so they say, okay, well, we've been fishing, hadn't caught anything. And they do it the way Jesus said. They have so many fish, the boat starts to go under. You know, it's just incredible. And they're all shocked at this. And so they know that there's miracles associated with Jesus. And then in Mark chapter 1, this shows you that all four of these guys, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, all four were called to Jesus to become official disciples on the same day. And as Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with hired servants and went after him, went after Jesus. I like that, went after him. You know, when did you start going after Jesus? I went after him when I was 18, you know, and uh, when you got serious about your faith. Went after, sounds like the old West, you know, they went after him. I just, that popped out at me. I liked it. And uh, so they follow him because of his message. I mean, they're leaving their jobs, leaving their father and all that. I mean, they're not going to be gone from the area, but they're going to spend most of their time with Christ. But So what made them do that? Well, they had seen miracles. They had seen miracles performed by Jesus and knew something to this guy. And so we're at least going to kind of be with them and see what's going on here. All right. So they were fishermen, all four of these guys, and including Simon, who were focused on. And fishing in this day was work. It was very hard work. Day after day they worked, except for one day, the Sabbath. Six days a week. Sometimes they worked all night. We know that. They were involved in the sailing of boats and the repair of boats and in the pulling in of nets full of fish and the cleaning of the fish and the selling of the fish and then the cleaning and the mending of the nets. And they did this both in the cold winds of winter and in the scorching sun of summer and amidst the great storms that would arise at various times on that sea. And there was also the paying of harbor fees and fishing fees, which was part of the day, and the hiring of men to help with the work, because that was part of it too. So there's a lot to all this. And this is what the fishermen of Galilee did back then, and this is what Simon did. And so when you see all that and kind of really kind of reflect on it, this tells you that Simon was strong and he had grit and he was faithful got up every day and just did what he had to do. And it was a lot of work. He had a strong work ethic, but he had a lot of grit to be in this kind of job. And while Simon did this, and here we go, his wife ran the household in Capernaum. And I say his wife, yes, his wife. We know that Simon, who will become Peter, was married. We know this in two ways. First off, his mother-in-law, the mother of his wife is mentioned in scripture. And we're also told that Peter's wife traveled with him after the ascension. Paul brings that up. So here's Mark chapter 1 again. And immediately he left the synagogue and he entered the house of Simon and Andrew. Now this is in Capernaum. And with James and John, they're there too. Now Simon's mother-in-law, the mother of Simon's wife, that's some versions put it that way, lay sick with a fever and immediately they told him of her. And he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she served them. All right, so there's a mother-in-law that implies a wife, 
And then 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul, he's talking about various things. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to our food and drink? Do we not have the right to be accompanied by a wife as the other apostles and the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? So he's talking about other apostles, including Cephas, who's Peter, uh, were accompanied on as they traveled by their wives, by their wives. And now some, because I did a lot of reading on this, um, and some play exegetical gymnastics to try to get Peter unmarried for some reason. I don't, I don't get that. I mean, that's a God ordained that. That's a good thing, marriage. He ordained it in the, right off the bat in the Garden of Eden, right? It's, it's a good thing. <laughs> so, and, and the Bible seems to be clearly putting this forth um, in, in a couple of ways. So that's that. Now, during Jesus' three-year ministry, he spent a lot of time in Simon's house in Capernaum. I'm going to tell more about that in a second. But during that three years, he was there a lot. Simon's home in Capernaum, and Simon's wife was there while that was going on. Peter was there. Simon was there. Peter was there. And, and then after the crucifixion and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the apostles spent time in Jerusalem, and then they went about spreading the faith, planting churches throughout the Roman world. And Peter did this, we know, and his wife apparently was with him because Paul said she was. Now, so if this is true, how come we don't hear more about her, right? You know, I mean, it's, it's just interesting. Well, we don't know why we don't know more about her. Scripture does not mention everything. If it mentioned everything, the book would be enormous, right? And so it doesn't. Something similar at, at a certain level occurs with Jesus' mother, Mary. She's rarely mentioned as being with Jesus. Occasionally she is, right? but it's not as much as she was actually with him. Every time she's with them, she would have been with them much. It's not mentioned that she was there. And so, and I look at that as sort of a sacred silence. It's kind of like the church has a tradition. The first person to record it in scripture to see the resurrected Christ was Mary Magdalene. Um, and that's very powerful. Uh, the Catholic church has a tradition that says that he appeared to his mother first, which makes perfect sense to me, right? But it's not in scripture. And so why not? Well, it's kind of a sacred silence. Some things are just kind of really sacred. And, and that get-together after he's back to life, that had to be something. And so there, there's something to that. So just because we don't have details given and all these explanations of Peter's wife doesn't mean that she wasn't there. So as we kind of look at Simon and th think about him, Simon was a strong and gritty married fisherman. And while Simon spent his days doing all the things involved in fishing, his wife was busy with all the hard work necessary for hearth and home. The visits to the market and the cooking of meals, the tending, they would have livestock. Most of these families had at least some livestock. And the care for everyone in her house. And we know that would have been her husband, Simon. Uh, her own mother was there. We know that. Uh, were there any children? We don't know. We're not told. It's an interesting thought, though. And Peter's brother, Andrew, seemed to have lived there, too. And was he married? And was his wife there? It's hard to know. Uh, but back in this day, houses in this day often housed a number of people, immediate family, extended family, and others. And this was not abnormal to have a lot of people kind of living together. What were the houses like in Jesus' time? And for this... I'm going to use Monsignor Charles Pope. I don't know if you know him. He's, it was everything he, I read by him, I like. Uh, but he had an article, What Were Typical Homes Like in Jesus' Time? And he says, In Jesus' Time, the smallest homes of the very poor might be little more than a square stone structure covered with a whitewashed sort of stucco. There would typically be one larger multi-purpose room and a smaller back room for the animals. Some houses in hilly regions were partial cave dwellings built up against the limestone rock face, perhaps with the front section built into it. The traditional site at the House of the Annunciation in Nazareth seems to have employed this strategy. Such structures were easy to build, and there was a certain natural coolness to them. In other words, the, the house where Mary was when Angel Gabriel came and, and you had the Annunciation go on. Um, looks like it was this kind of house, and I'll show you a picture of it in a second. Other houses were built around a central open court with small rooms opening onto the court. These retained the cool, coolness by allowing air to move freely through. Cooking was also done in the open central court often. 
Uh, if you were wealthy, you would have a kitchen, super wealthy. If the family had some animals, they were often kept in part of the house at night. Families sometimes included several generations living together, and they lived under one roof, and there was little or no privacy. So just an aside here, Mary's house, where Gabriel appeared to her, uh, where the eternal word became flesh, <laughs> right in that it, this is un, that this is the church of the Annunciation in Nazareth, and you go inside and you go down some steps to the first century level, and there is the house where all that happened, where Mary was. And this is Christians marked this place from the beginning. All the important things that happened in the ministry of Jesus after he was resurrected and ascended and the church started, Christians knew where all these places were, and they became very important to the Christians, and, and they marked them and kept them, and that's how come we know where a lot of these locations are, including this. So this is what Gabriel, this is covered by the Basilica of the Annunciation, and it appears to be built into the side of a rock formation. Nazareth is very hilly, and so there were a number of houses, and I've got an example of a house that's built into the side of a rock formation. So in the house that Mary was in would have probably been something like that. All right, so, but these, in, up in Galilee, uh, all of the archaeology and so forth, these were the types of houses that were up there. And so these are the kinds of houses that would have been in uh, Capernaum. And, and we know that because they've done a lot of excavation. So this is the typical first century houses of Galilee. And so Simon Peter's house would have looked something like one of these two kind of structures here. The roof was really important. Uh, you, people would go up there. It also collected rainwater. Um, and uh, they were by the Sea of Galilee, so they might not have had as much need as other places for collecting that rainwater. On to the second paragraph. Uh, you would store tools up there. Laundry would be put out to dry. And they used the roof a lot. People would gather up there to talk, especially in the evening. Cooler up there. I'd be up there in the evening. Scripture also speaks of it as a place to just to retire, to pray. Peter, in the book of Acts, he's praying on a roof. In the evening, when it was cool, people sat and talked. And then better weather, they would often sleep there. The climate of the Mediterranean provided a, a nice setting for be, being up on your roof, right? Just trying to give you a feel, of because we're going to be talking about Peter's house in Capernaum off and on quite a bit, because so much happens there. And I want you to get just a feel of what the house might have been like. Uh, most of the inner doors of these houses were narrow. Only the door facing the street was wider and had a hinged door that could be secured. In poor homes, the floor was simply pounded earth. More affluent people might have pebbles or baked clay tiles. Uh, wooden floors could be afforded only by the very wealthy. Ordinary people went to the well or spring or fount. But like I said, they were right on the Sea of Galilee. That might have been different for these towns on the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum. Um, local streams to get water. Most of the houses had no fireplaces. When it did grow cold, there were charcoal braziers uh, where small fires would be kindled. Uh, lighting was not very abundant. Small oil lamps were used. Much time was spent out of doors, so interior lights were less necessary. The furniture extreme, I'm not going to read all this. Furniture extremely simple, and it describes just kind of most houses had very basic um, items of furniture. Uh, second line, second paragraph, most moderately well-off families did have a low table that they could recline and eat at. Sitting on chairs at higher tables to eat was rare. Wealthy people would do that sometimes. In small houses, cooking was done out back on an open fire or a fire pit, and kitchen items were kept in the storeroom. Only the largest homes had a dedicated area with a fiery oven, uh, in other words, a kitchen. Bedding was rolled out on the floor. The bed as a piece of furniture off the floor was largely unknown at that time, except among the very wealthy. Family members stretched out on mats, covering themselves with their own cloaks. Many slept on the roof in the warmer months. All houses seemed to have had a bath of some sort. The ancient Jews were very much concerned about being clean on a couple of levels. They saw it is related to holiness and the ritual purity, keeping the law of Moses. They had to have access to a bath. Latrines were more likely outhouses and were situated away from the main dwelling. They may have been shared facilities between several houses, depending on the size and layout of the town or village. So that's kind of the atmosphere that we find ourselves as we're looking at Peter and everything going on in his home in Capernaum. All right, so Peter's home in Capernaum. Now, this is interesting. We're talking about where he lived, and we know where he lived. And uh, the ruins are there, and it's very, very interesting. So again, there's Jerusalem, and you go north to the Sea of Galilee, and on the Sea of Galilee is the town of Capernaum, and there is Capernaum. There's part of it, a 
lot of Capernaum has not been excavated yet. Uh, but so we're above the Sea of Galilee, looking down upon the town of Capernaum. And so this is where Jesus spent most of his time in the three years of his ministry. He would go down to Jerusalem for the holy days. Um, he would travel a bit around the northern part of Israel, but he was here a lot. This was his base of operation. All right, so here's Capernaum. And just to kind of check it out, the red circle, there's, you see under the ground, there's a lot of Capernaum that has not been excavated yet. There's just enough to give you a feel of what the city was like, but it was much bigger than this. And then the, you see the, the um, blue part was excavated. The yellow circle is around the synagogue. The, the foundation of that synagogue that you see, the ruins of that synagogue, the foundation was the one that Jesus taught in and they, all these guys were in. It was the one that was set up when Peter was living there, uh, just down the road from the synagogue. You see Peter's house covered by a church. Um, it looks like a flying saucer has landed. And we know that they're aliens now, so maybe, maybe they landed on Peter's house there. Anyway, it's an interesting shape. Um, but that is a church. And so here's Capernaum. You see the houses, the, that what's been excavated from the first century. Uh, this is where Peter's house was. Uh, after the whole Christian thing happened and Jesus was raised and ascended and the church took off and was exploding, uh, Christians made Peter's house in Capernaum a church. And that's why it's shaped like that. Uh, it had the regular shape to it, but then they took it and they made it into a church in the first century. And so this is what you could see before the church was built over it. As I told you, there's the church over it, white, but that's a picture from before, and now the church is over it. And that's a Catholic church that was built in the 70s, and it's kind of hovering over the ruins of Peter's house. Um, and so you can go into the church, and you can go into the center of the church and look down, it's glass, and you can see the, the ruins of Peter's house through the glass there, or you can go up close and you can look underneath the church because, like I said, it's kind of hovering above it and you can see what's underneath it, even from the side. And so this, this is just amazing to see this because all of the things that happened, you know, Jesus stayed there so often and so many miracles were performed there. And we're going to, starting next week, we're going to see many of these things that were happening there at that house. This is kind of what Capernaum looked like. It's a major, a, a kind of a little sketch there of what it looked like in the first century. There were harbors and, and everything. There was a lot more to it. So this was Simon and his wife's life before Jesus called Simon to be a disciple. Uh, but what was it like after Jesus called uh, Peter and, and Andrew, Simon and Andrew? Well, as you read the Gospels, as I said before, you see that Jesus made Simon's house in Capernaum his home and the base of operation for his ministry in Israel. Um, look at Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he, Jesus, was at home. Um, so people even started calling Peter's house Jesus' home because that's where he was staying. Jesus' home? Yeah, he's home. All right. And then you go down to Peter's house. That's where he was living. And so you can see, and even the, the, when you go, you can see the gate into uh, the town of Capernaum today. And there is a sign as you enter, it says Capernaum, the town of Jesus, and this is, which is true because this is where he stayed in Peter's house in Capernaum. All right. So Jesus is staying there. So I'm going to kind of describe to you the life Peter and his wife, what they were doing, the kind of life they were having. That was before Jesus called Simon Peter to be a follower and then decided to stay there almost all the time up when he's up in the north. And so how life must have changed for Mrs. Simon uh, when that happened. I can't even imagine. I can't even, even imagine. And so as we go through Scripture, we see things that are happening at Simon's house. I want to think Jesus is there, uh, but uh, Simon's there, and his wife is there. Andrew's there. All the apostles are there. Mary's probably there, too. I mean, Peter's wife and Mary talked, chatted. Peter talked with Mary. You know, we don't think about these things, which would have been just naturally going on with all these people so close together for so long. So it's good stuff. So Simon Peter did not, as some think, leave his wife when he was called by Jesus. Yes, there were periods of time when he was away, and a lot like a businessman who goes on a business trip and then comes home. However, during that three-year period with Jesus, Simon's wife would have been with Peter much of the time because Jesus was so often in Capernaum. 
And then after the ascension, it seems that Simon's wife traveled with him, because Paul said that. And like I said, that's a good thing. Marriage is a very good thing. And so I don't, I don't know why we would be scared that Peter is married. I, I didn't even know people were scared of that until I've been studying this and looking into it. Um, but I mean, because this in Genesis 2, in the beginning, God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a helper comparable to him. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I mean, that's just, that's so cool. And the meaning of one flesh, a man and a, and a woman come together, husband and wife, and they become one flesh. Obviously, uh, people talk about they become one, one in soul. And that happens, you know, there's this spiritual oneness uh, that happens. But in a practical sense, it just means having a kid, having a baby. Because uh, you come together, two people, and then one flesh, he's holding up. That was, there was two people made that one. In that one, those two people are both there. So two become one flesh. I think that's so so cool. And this is from God. This whole family thing is from God. And it should be lifted up. It's being attacked today from all sides, you know, gender and family and all these precious, wonderful gifts. I, I, I told my class as we've gotten started because we're going through Genesis. Um, I said, there's, there's nothing better than getting married. If you're a guy, you get married to a woman and you have kids. And it's nothing better than that. And then when the grandkids start coming along, it's like, wow, you know, I didn't know we could go to this level of, of awesomeness, honestly. But I said, I tell them the world is going to tell you, you know, influencers, entertainers, et cetera, are going to tell you to go do this, go do that. And they're going to pull you away from that. And I said, you're going to miss a great blessing, uh, the greatest blessing, the way God has designed for the human race, because there's nothing like this, you know, nothing that can touch it at all. Nothing close. All right, so I'm coming in for a link. So Mrs. Simon, Mrs. Simon Peter always had much to do. However, during the years of Jesus' ministry in Israel, things, like I said, went to another level because Simon's house in Capernaum saw enormous activity. And we're going to start looking at that next week. But I conclude tonight by saying this. Jesus came and he called this fisherman, Simon of Capernaum, into his inner circle and then, as we're going to see, he makes him chief apostle and then the church's chief bishop. This strong and gritty married man, a masculine man, maybe a father, who knows, who worked the arduous job of a fisherman, but he was a guy who had a sincere heart, deeply sincere heart for God, and he was filled with faith. He gave himself to the old covenant, and then when the new covenant came, when Jesus came with the new covenant, he gave himself to that. When God did something, Peter was all in. Peter was all in. He sensed God. He knew God was in something. He heard the voice of God. Uh, when Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me, right? And Peter heard the voice of God and he heard the voice of Christ and he followed the one true God. This is in John chapter 6. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You, in some versions, put alone, and that's proper to put it there. You alone have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, that's a fantastic answer. Because what Peter just heard in John chapter 6, he didn't understand it yet either. It's the whole eat my flesh, drink my blood. And all these people took off after Jesus started teaching that. And that's what Jesus turned around to the 12 and said, you guys are going to take off too. And Peter said, <laughs> where would we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Basically, Peter saying, I have no idea what you just said, but I know everything you say is the word of God. And I will, and maybe one day I'll understand it. And he, and he does understand it because later on, Jesus makes it obvious what he was talking about. Uh, but that's just the heart of Peter. He loved God and he heard God's voice and he served God and he was sensitive to God. So when Jesus came, God in the flesh, he was like, yes, he has the words of eternal life. And he followed Jesus. So this is, like I said, he's a tough, gritty, faithful, hard worker, but his heart was very sensitive to God and committed to God. And so Jesus found this strong, gritty man, this faithful man who was faithful to the old covenant. And then he was, he was faithful to his family, faithful to his work, faithful to his friends. And he built the one holy Catholic, Jesus builds the one holy Catholic and apostolic church upon this guy who's like this. I think that's interesting. And as we're going to see throughout the study, Simon Peter was faithful and he was so loyal to Jesus. And yes, there was the denial. It's kind of funny. I mean, when you when you pass away 
and people are speaking words about you, and let's say your whole life has been awesomeness, right? Except there was one little bleep on it that was bad. And at the funeral, they said, oh, you know what Tommy did? <laughs> Boom, and forget the rest. And I feel like that happens with King David, and it was what he did was bad, King David. We all, Bathsheba. His, his, his life was incredible, besides that very dark year that he had. And it was dark, I mean, it was dark. But there was more to him, and the same with Peter. Yeah, there was the denial, but and I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to try to put that in context and put ourselves there in the courtyard that night when he, he did that. I'm going to do that next week. So there was a, the denial, but big picture, Simon Peter loved Jesus and was deeply loyal to him, big time. It'd be crazy. And he wanted nothing more than to help Jesus and protect him and defend him and promote him. He was all about that. And God desires, and this is one of the things we always want to talk about as we go through this study, God desires the church to reflect the nature of Simon Peter. That's why I think Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on you. He wants the church to reflect the nature of Simon Peter. Masculine, strong, faithful, plain speaking, straightforward, gritty, earthy, family-centered, work-centered, exhibiting great love for Jesus and his word, committed to seeking and promoting truth. As was Peter, so should be the church. 